Hey kiddos, welcome back. We're about to start a new unit. This unit involves states of matter. And we'll start by talking about something called the kinetic molecular theory of matter. The basic premise of this theory is that it describes the behavior of matter in terms of particle motion. In fact, the Greek term for motion is kinetic. And so when we talk about the kinetic molecular theory, we're talking about molecules or particles and their motion. Now, I have seven postulates or parts to this kinetic molecular theory. Most of them pertain to gases. And I think you'll agree with all of them. Um, at this point in the year, you know that all matter is composed of small particles, molecules, ions, or atoms. And you will learn that the molecules of gases are separated from their neighbors by distances much greater than the size of the individual molecule. The volume of the individual molecule is so small it's considered to be insignificant. Number four, particles are in constant random straight line motion until they collide with other particles or the walls of their containers. Number five, the collisions are elastic, which means there's no change in the total kinetic energy of the two particles before and after their collision. Number six, the average kinetic energy is the same for all the molecules, regardless of what they are, so long as the temperature is the same. Now, that does not mean that all molecules at a particular instant have the exact same kinetic energy at a particular temperature. It means their average kinetic energy will be the same, so long as the temperature is the same. So some might have a little higher energy, some might have a little lower energy, but that average, so long as the temperature um, does not change, is going to be constant. We'll describe that in a bit more detail later on in this unit. Number seven, this kinetic energy is directly proportional to a new temperature scale for us, the Kelvin temperature scale, which is based on something called absolute zero. So let's begin by talking about gas particles and listing some simple properties of gases. Perhaps you've heard these back in your junior high class. Now, number one, you should know that gases can flow. They do have small attractive forces to each other, but they're essentially negligible, so they can move past one another. If molecules can move past one another, or particles can move past one another, we say they can, fl they can flow. Number two, gases occupy the entire volume of their container. So, occupy the entire volume of their container. So, if I had a small jar that was sealed with some oxygen gas in it, that oxygen gas would occupy the volume of that small jar. If I opened it up into the room, what would that oxygen gas do? <laughs> That's right, it would expand. It would, end up, it would end up, over time, occupying the entire volume of that room. So, regardless of the size of their container, they occupy its entire volume. Number three, um, most of the volume of a gas is occupied by empty space. So gases have a very low density, much, much lower than the density of the other two states of matter, liquids and solids. Once again, most of the volume occupied by a gas is empty space. The individual gas particles themselves their volume is essentially negligible in contrast to the volume of the container that they're in. And because of this, because of this great amount of space between individual gas particles, gases are said to be compressible. That means we can push them closer to one another. In fact, in contrast to that, they are expandable. So we can expand them and we can compress them. Here, here's a interesting illustration. Take the jar in the middle with a little piston on it. And so we have a fixed volume of a gas. And you could measure the average distance between these gas particles. Okay, Because there's such a big distance between them, we can push that piston down, decreasing the volume of the container, 
and as a result, the average distance between particles will become closer. We call that compression. If we move that piston up, decreasing the pressure, the distance between the particles, the individual particles, becomes much greater, and that's called expansion. Okay? All right. Gas pressure. We'll do a few demonstrations in class for you related to gas pressure that I think you'll enjoy. Gas particles exert pressure when they exert or when they collide with the walls of their container. Um, because an individual gas particle has such a small mass, an individual particle exerts very little pressure. However, if I have a liter sized container, it can hold up to 10 to the 20 second gas particles. So with that many particles exerting just a little bit of pressure, it ends up with 10 to the 20 second particles doing that, that the pressure can be actually quite high. Specifically, let's talk now about air pressure. Fortunately, our Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere. It actually extends into space for several hundred kilometers. Because the particles in air move in every direction, they exert pressure in all directions, not just in a downward direction, but in a sideways direction and in an upwards direction. That pressure is called atmospheric pressure or air pressure. Air pressure varies at different points on the Earth. Now, that's because gravity is greater at the surface of the Earth. There are more particles than at higher altitudes where the force of gravity is lower. Since there are fewer particles at higher elevation, the pressure is lower than where there's the greater concentration of particles at lower altitudes. And therefore, the atmospheric pressure would be higher. So the bottom line is, Air pressure is lower at high altitudes than it is at sea level. A device that we use to measure air pressure is called a barometer. I'll try to describe it here, but I'll show you one in class and hopefully it'll make more sense. If you can imagine a test tube that's one meter long, and I fill that test tube up to the very, very top with mercury, and then I invert that test tube, of course covering the hole with my finger, and place the bottom of that uh, test tube, the opening of that test tube, in a pool of mercury, like we have in this illustration here. Atmospheric pressure is pushing on the surface of that reservoir or pool of mercury. Well, at the same time, the mercury inside my test tube is pushing down. It's trying to get out of that tube. It's being pulled down by gravity, while the reservoir is resisting that because the air pressure is pushing it down, not allowing it to move up any higher. Nevertheless, if that tube is a meter tall, some of the mercury will escape and start filling up that reservoir until it reaches an equilibrium. The downward force of the mercury trying to get out of that test tube will be counteracted by the atmosphere pushing mercury up into the tube and so we reach an equilibrium. Now, that turns out to be about 30 inches of mercury at sea level that the atmosphere can support. Now, we usually don't like to use inches in science, and so oftentimes, barometric pressure is read in millimeters of mercury. So on a typical day at sea level, the atmosphere can support a column of mercury about 760 millimeters tall. Now, here in Salt Lake City, that's a bit different. On a typical day in Salt Lake City, the atmosphere can only support a column of mercury that's about 645 millimeters tall. Once again, that's because the density of the air particles here in Salt Lake, an altitude of about 4,500 feet, is much lower than the density of gas particles at sea level. So we can support a shorter column of mercury. The atmospheric pressure is lower. Now, oftentimes you'll hear during a weather broadcast that they will tell you what the barometric pressure is at that particular time. Now, they will correct that barometric pressure reading to sea level, and they will report it in inches of mercury. So, on a typical weather broadcast, the barometric pressure will be somewhere around 30 inches of mercury. If the barometric pressure is rising, the weatherman will tell you that. And that usually means that a storm is moving out and we're headed for good weather. If the barometric pressure is falling, 
That usually means that a storm is coming in and we're headed for bad weather. So barometric pressure is a good indicator as to what type of weather you will be experiencing. In fact, you'll often hear weathermen talk about high pressure areas and low pressure areas, and that's related to the barometric pressure. Now, gases do not always behave like we'd like them to. <laughs> we call them real gases. However, in this class we like to treat them as if they're ideal. An ideal gas means that the particles have absolutely no intermolecular force of attraction between them. So no force of attraction between the gas particles. However, gases don't always behave that way. They have intermolecular forces of attraction that cause them to be, well, attracted to each other. And as a result, they start taking on some liquid properties. We call these real gases. Now, other than intermolecular forces, pressure and temperature can also alter the behavior of a gas. So think for a minute about temperature. When the temperature is high, gas particles have all sorts of kinetic energy. They're bouncing off of each other in the walls of their container. They're moving around very, very quickly. They behave more ideally. However, when I lower the temperature, and lower it, and lower it, and lower it, their kinetic energy drops. And as a result, they're able to get closer to each other, and they start taking on some liquid properties at low temperatures. Pressure. Well, what happens when I increase the pressure in a container? Aren't I literally pushing the gas particles closer to each other? So as the pressure raises, the particles get closer and closer and closer to each other, and their intermolecular forces of attraction can eventually take over and cause them, if the pressure is high enough and the temperature is, low, temperature is low enough, to condense. They start taking on, once again, liquid properties. So, at what types of pressure and temperature would a gas behave more ideally? Well, it turns out gases behave more ideally at high temperatures, and low, low pressures. Now, what happens to a gas if the opposite occurs? Well, if the temperature is low and the pressure is high, a gas will turn into a liquid and it will condense. And you can see that liquid particles are much, much closer to each other and their properties are much, much different than the properties of gases. Okay? Now, the next time we see each other, we'll list some of the properties of liquids, and we'll talk more about them. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.